My name is Paul Marston. I work with Respec. We were in charge of completing the total maximum daily load studies on the lakes and streams in the Mississippi River Brainerd watershed. Uh, in this presentation, I'll be reviewing uh, the uh, lake uh, TMDL uh, results uh, for this management zone. And uh, hopefully the information is useful. Uh, typically we would be doing this presentation in person. Um, so hopefully in this format, uh, I'm able to convey uh, the information clearly uh, and um, in a manner that is easy to understand and can be useful for everyone listening. I'm going to start the presentation by providing a watershed overview for the Mississippi River Brainerd watershed as a whole. Uh, then we're going to focus in on the management zone of concern and the impaired lakes that are located there. Uh, I'm then going to provide a high level overview of the BATA model and how it was used to develop the total maximum daily loads for each of these lakes. And then we will look more closely at each of the lakes uh, and review the draft allocation tables for the TMDL, the load reductions necessary to meet the water quality standards, and where those reductions may come from, as well as the uh, RAPS uh, restoration strategies. The Mississippi River Brainerd watershed was separated into three separate management zones during the RAPS process, which helped guide the prioritization efforts for restoration and protection strategies. Uh, the three management zones uh, that make up the Mississippi River Brainerd watershed include the north, the central, and the south management zones. Uh, these were uh, separated based upon uh, geographic area, uh, common land use cover, and uh, similar pollutant uh, sources. Across the Mississippi River Brainerd watershed, there is a total of 18 impaired lakes uh, for nutrients. And in total, 11 of those have TMDLs, uh, TMDL studies completed, which include Gunn, Fleming, Elm, Ripple, Crowing, CB, Fawn, Lower Mission, Trace, Big Swan, and Moose. There were seven impaired lakes uh, for nutrients that did not have TMDL studies completed. To determine if a lake is impaired uh, is based on the MPCA standard. Uh, and these standards vary across the state dependent upon the ecoregion that the lake is located in. And the Mississippi River Brainerd watershed is located in two ecoregions with the southern portion located in the north central hardwood forests ecoregion. Uh, and on the map that's denoted by the thick gray line that kind of starts up in the north, comes down south near Long Prairie, and then heads east. And so lakes in the north central hardwood forests are held to the water quality standards for that ecoregion, which is uh, for deep lakes, 40 parts per billion and for shallow lakes, 60 parts per billion. Much of the watershed is located in the Northern Lakes and Forests ecoregion. And for this ecoregion, there's no separate standard for shallow lakes. It is just the 30 parts per billion uh, for phosphorus for all lakes. The central management zone has a total of three lakes impaired for um, excess nutrients, uh, with two, the Crow Wing and CB, having TMDL uh, studies completed for them. And these lakes are all in the Northern Lakes and Forests ecoregion, so they fall under uh, the water quality standard of 30 parts per billion for total phosphorus. Before I review each individual TMDL Lake in this management district, I want to provide a high-level overview of the BATA model that is used to develop these load allocation tables and the final reductions necessary to meet the water quality standard. So the first step in developing a BATA model is modeling the current conditions of the lake. And that is done by entering uh, the various uh, pollutants and pollutant sources 
that aren't in a lake. So that is tributaries and lake shed runoff, which uh, it comes from the calibrated HSPF model outputs. Uh, septic systems, which uh, we have an approach to estimate the load coming from that. Um, point sources, if there are any, and atmospheric deposition. Once the loads are entered into the model, uh, you calibrate the model to represent uh, and match the observed water quality that was uh, collected by either the MPCA or local government units. Uh, this is where you determine if there is internal loading occurring. And this is done by what we call a mass balance analysis um, and also using professional judgment uh, based upon lake characteristics, uh, observed water quality, uh, depth and temp DO profiles to determine if there's likely anoxic conditions at the base, if there's mixing. Um, and together, uh, use that approach to determine if there likely is internal loading. And finally, you run calibration uh, and cal add calibration factors to match the model so that it simulates the observed water quality data for TP, chlorophyll A, and SECI depth. Once you have a calibrated existing conditions model, um, that is the current load allocation. Uh, from there, you can determine what reductions are necessary to meet the water quality standards. Uh, and so you reduce the inputting loads, uh, incoming loads, largely tributaries and lake shed runoff, until you reach that water quality standard. Uh, in addition, you add a 10% for a margin of safety to ensure that uh, through these reductions, you are able to achieve that water quality standard. Crow Wing Lake is a headwater lake with uh, no upstream uh, tributary. So the, this entire area is its lake shed area, although it is a fairly large lake shed. Uh, with a total of uh, about 10,000, over 10,000 acres. Um, much of that area is uh, either forest or wetland, uh, followed then by cropland and developed land cover types. Using the HSPF model, uh, we can look at what the annual uh, total phosphorus loads are from each of the land cover types within the lake shed area. Now it should be noted that these numbers uh, for the drainage area total are not going to align perfectly with what's in the model uh, and that is because these numbers are land-based loading uh, totals and so uh, due to attenuation and other um, model processes that occur in HSPF. This might not align perfectly with what you see in the allocation table, uh, but it is going to be uh, relatively or very close. But this allows us to look at and tie what loads, you know, uh, when you look at the lake, where they're coming from and what areas could be targeted for reductions. And so we can see here, uh, looking at uh, the land cover uh, load source assessment that uh, cropland contributes the largest share of the uh, phosphorus load to uh, Crow Wing Lake. And that's followed by wetlands, although wetlands do make up a large percent of the area. Um, and then, or sorry, developed is in front of wetlands with 22%, wetlands at 20%, and then forests. So this is the Crow Wing Lake draft load allocation table. So there's a lot going on here, so I'll walk through the structure of the table first, and then we'll look at the results. Uh, the first two columns, starting on the left, uh, looks at the various uh, load sources. And so this is broken into two categories, and this is the waste load and then the uh, general load. The waste load is going to be for permitted sources. So this uh, could include point sources, if there were any, or permitted stormwater um, uh, discharges for uh, construction industrial. Uh, f then for um, the load below, uh, the load allocation, this includes the lake shed, uh, any tributaries, if there are any upstream, uh, internal loading, uh, septic system loading, the SSTS, and atmospheric deposition. The two columns to the right of it is showing the existing TP load, and this is based on the calibrated bathtub model 
uh, to current uh, conditions based on the observed water quality. So this is the existing load um, uh, matching current water quality um, observed data in both pounds per year and pounds per day. And then the next two columns to the right of that uh, is the allowable TP load. And this is the load uh, that is needed to be um, achieved if or to meet the water quality standard in addition to that 10% margin of safety. The 10% margin of safety is added to account for any uncertainties um, in the data to make sure that if this load is achieved, uh, the lake will meet water quality standards. And then the final two columns on the left show the load reduction to achieve the water quality standards. So we can see for Crow Wing Lake, uh, the lake shed load contributes a significant or majority uh, portion of the total phosphorus load reaching Crow Wing Lake. Uh, and that is followed by internal loading and then septics uh, or atmospheric deposition and septics. And so to achieve the water quality standard, if we go all the way to the far right column, we can see that the lake shed will need to have total phosphorus loads uh, reduced 49%, uh, internal loading a reduction of 8%. And for all allocation tables uh, it is the approach or the assumption of 100% reduction so that septic systems are not contributing any nutrients uh, to the lake. Uh, so overall, uh, for Crow Wing Lake to meet the water quality standards, I need to see a 41% reduction in the overall phosphorus load reaching the lake. To look at what reductions are needed on certain land use or land cover types, um, we did a source reduction analysis here. And so this shows that existing TP load coming from each of the existing land cover types um, in the lake shed area for Crow Wing Lake. Uh, we can see to achieve what reduction is needed in the load allocation table, um, we need to reduce uh, total phosphorus loads from the developed pasture and cropland land cover types by 80%. This is a table of the Crow Wing Lake draft restoration strategies, which were developed as a part of the RAPS project by the project team. And so for Crow Wing Lake, practices to achieve the water quality uh, standard and the reductions called for in the allocation table include nutrient management, for both fertilizer rates and, and timing of application to reduce the nutrient loads from cropland, uh, improving septic systems, uh, shoreline stabilization, uh, in lake management, and this is based on you know, the presence of curly leaf pondweed. Uh, and while the Direct results of curly pondweed on internal loading vary from lake to lake. Um, it is recommended still for the lake to work with um, Minnesota DNR to manage and restore a healthy native vegetative population. And as well as uh, public outreach and implementing Minnesota DNR's Score Your Shore to help increase awareness uh, for local property owners and what their impacts are on water quality in Crow Wing Lake. The next lake that we're looking at in the central management zone is CB Lake. Uh, CB has um, a larger drainage area than Crow Wing Lake, including a, a large lake shed area, as well as a couple of upstream tributaries contributing um, to um, the lake. As far as the area, you can see a total of uh, 20,000 acres are draining to CB Lake. Uh, and much of that is made up of forest, 39% of it, uh, followed by wetland. Um, and there is still a decent amount of grassland, cropland, and pasture area uh, in the drainage area as well. Looking at the uh, total phosphorus loads uh, coming 
by land cover type uh, based on the HSPF model, we see that the uh, majority of the total phosphorus flow that reaches CV Lake is from croplands. Um, and this is almost 50% of the load uh, is, is re or from the landscape is due to cropland. Um, following that is uh, wetlands and then forests developed land cover, uh, grassland and pasture. So looking at the draft uh, total maximum daily load allocation table for CV, um, looking at the various uh, load loading sources, uh, the single largest contributor uh, is the lake shed uh, with 2,300 uh, pounds a year, and then the tributary um, upstream of it, they both also um, contribute a decent amount of total phosphorus. Um, and looking at the reductions needed for each of those, we see that uh, relatively similar percentage-wise, but we have a 48% for tributary 433, 49% reduction in total phosphorus loads for tributary 435, 45% uh, reduction in total phosphorus loads in the lake shed, and that 100% uh, load reduction for septics. Uh, and for the overall load allocation, that's a 46% reduction in the total phosphorus. So looking at where these reductions can come from, um, breaking it out, these three separate tables here, we've got one for each tributary, 433 and 435, as well as the lake shed. And so these are using the HSPF uh, land cover type uh, loads for phosphorus. Um, we can see that to achieve the necessary total phosphorus reductions targeting developed uh, pasture and cropland land cover types uh, in tributary 433 uh, will require a 78% reduction to those land cover types. Uh, in tributary 435, 72% reduction in total phosphorus coming from those land cover types. And in the lake shed area, a 75% reduction coming from those land cover types. And the restoration strategies that were identified in the RAPS process to achieve these reductions include nutrient management, uh, both on fertilizer rates and uh, timing uh, to reduce the nutrient uh, loads coming from cropland areas, septic system improvements, uh, shoreline stabilization, as well as in lake management of the um, curly leaf pondweed uh, to establish native uh, vegetative population. And that covers the two lakes that had a total maximum daily load study completed for them that are located in the central management zone. Um, here is some contact information for those that are interested. Uh, MPCA will also include contact information in dist distributing uh, this uh, presentation. I just want to say thank you uh, for taking the time to listen to this presentation. Again, this is not how we had originally planned, hoped it would have been in person, and that's typically how these presentations go. Uh, but hopefully, uh, through recording this, we're still able to present the information uh, and do so in a useful uh, manner for, for those who have um, interest in this. Uh, feel free to reach out and, and ask any questions um, if there was anything unanswered or if you're uncertain about anything in the presentation and the TMD report also provides uh, additional information um, as it relates to these uh, studies and so it's a good great resource to check as well again thank you for your time uh, stay safe uh, stay healthy um, thank you very much